All right. What is up, everybody? This is uh, the Misfit Happy Hour. Uh, this is the crypto portion of it. My name is Spencer Regal, and I'll be diving into crypto, getting a unique guest, and, and just talking after hours with people. So today I have John Devine. John, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yes. Hello. John Devine here. Spencer, thanks for having me on to the Misfits Happy Hour. Looking forward to it. Um, you know, also, shout out to St. Lucci for putting this whole series together and uh you know it's, it's been great i was able to see some of the prior episodes great stuff that's being done here so thanks for having me yeah yeah so john i'll let you uh i'll let you dive into your background um and kind of give uh some clarity on on what you've done in the industry what you're doing currently and and what you're involved in sure yeah sure so um trading background for me I started as a market maker at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the Intercontinental Exchange. I was, I was blessed as you know, many successful traders are uh, to have a great mentor. And my, my mentor, uh, he was a significant trader at the CME for, for you know, many decades, quite frankly. And his name was Darren Joss. And he taught me about forward curves and how um, understanding the forward curve and how front month to the middle dates to the back end of the curve how they all work together and we we built a structure we call it the standard six and then the standard nine it's how we can work in a bunch of different um, futures markets and provide bids and offers to those to those markets and we were doing that for precious metals for interest rate swaps for the energy product spectrum along with agriculture and you know, that was, you know, really my, my jump into professional trading. I, I was, you know, I've traded all, you know, Asia hour, European hour, US hour markets in that regard and did that for a number of years. And then I got super into um, environmental products. So there was a burgeoning market for renewable energy credits and carbon offset markets you know, my, my educational background is, is in energy systems and fuels management. So there was a little bit of a synergy there. I ended up moving down to Puerto Rico and started, well, I built out a futures contract for a product called methanol. And I built that out with the CME and, uh, you know, in, in parallel with the CFTC, nice. those contract specs have to be defined, right? Yep. Um, and, you know, methanol is a, is a catalyst for the production of biodiesel. So I got super into uh, making markets on environmental products. And, you know, while I was in Puerto Rico, I got, you know, very into crypto and, you know, was fortunate enough to be hired by, at the time, the world's leading Ethereum hedge fund may still be, um, haven't checked the latest numbers, but you know, I, be, I was hired as an execution trader, uh, trading Ethereum. And, you know, from there, we were really just doing spot. There was no there really wasn't a developed options market and certainly not a developed listed futures market. There were perpetual swaps. Right. Um, but you know, one of my, one of my counterparties in that role, in, in that, in that role, I was trading pretty much with the entire digital asset OTC market. And one of my counterparties was block fills. They started doing some very interesting stuff on, on the options side of things. And it per perked up my interest. And it, long story short, ended up joining Blockfills uh, to make markets in crypto spot. Um, also for eligible contract participants, making markets in options, futures, doing lending and borrowing, et cetera. And that's where I sit today. I sit today at Blockfills and, and I'm right in the middle of, of these crypto OTC markets. All right. So I got a couple questions for you. One is, when you are, I mean, you, you notated that it was the biggest hedge fund for in terms of AUM in, in Ethereum terms, right? That's and right. back then, what, what year was this? Was this 2020, 2019? This is, this is early 2019. Okay. And I was watching some of the, like the futures markets on Deribit, the listed futures and all these kind of things, right? They have the perps. They weren't as liquid as they are today. Right. And, and so how are you how are you dealing that size and being one of the biggest players? Like, what is the order of operations executing those trades? Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. And that was a problem. You know, the, the when I first I mean, I'll take a step back on, you know, got 
got super interested in Bitcoin once the CFTC cleared that futures contract in 2017. Yep. And so I, I had a, a pretty good pulse on the marketplace. Now, I wasn't actively executing size orders at the time, not until early 2019. But that's a great way for me to, to kind of bring into focus. That there really wasn't a lot of liquidity right uh, back then and you know going back to 2017 I, I was looking at that gold or that bitcoin futures market on day one there was no liquidity right right so this was an issue and this is what i, what I mean by um you know i was dealing with pretty much every major counterparty in the otc market so to get size done even just a couple years ago you had to pull multiple levers right yeah and you had to be if you wanted to get size off you had to be talking to multiple desks and executing those orders in unison uh, with multiple counterparties to do to do real size. Now, crypto market moves extremely fast, as, as we all yeah. know, and, and not just in price terms, but also in tech and also in the number of participants who were able to, you know, re rework strategies from FX market making operations and commodity market making operations, and then rewire those strategies into crypto and some pretty big firms uh, were able to come on, you know, I'd, I'd say, you know, in the past couple of years, right? And, and now right. certainly in the past two years. So liquidity is, has, has beefed up across the board. To answer right. your question, it was very hard to get size done just a couple of years ago and you had to pull multiple levers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I go into conversations and talk to people that are in just in regular traditional equities, traditional options, futures markets, their biggest question is liquidity. Right. Yeah. And, and so from your side of things, what's the best way to get liquidity now? How deep are the books? What like what would you give as a great counter argument to this, in my opinion, a bad argument? Right. I think it's deeper than what most people think, but it's not we're not we're not the gold market, for instance. Certainly, certainly. And I, I think, you know, liquidity is always a chicken before the egg type question. And. For, for market makers to really scale up as they, as they have, um, there has to be that market demand. And, and quite frankly, there really wasn't enough institutional type demand until the past two years, let's say maybe three if you want to push it. So to answer the question directly, I would say when you look on the surface and you go to you know, one of these retail based exchanges, whether that's for spot or if that's for options or futures, what you're seeing on the screen might not, you know, might not be too exciting if you are, if you're super into depth of market. Yep. And I think this is certainly true in, in options and, uh, and to an extent the the dated futures market. So, you know, there's a reason, I, I think there's a reason for that. And a, a lot of you know, a lot of participants on the liquidity provision side of things are are still a bit hesitant to really show a size book, especially top of book on, on some of these products. And if you're, you know, if you're executing at an institutional scale, you really need to be talking to a counterparty that can deal OTC with eligible contract participants. I think that's where you find that institutional size liquidity. Interesting. Interesting. Coming directly to a counterparty, not going to a lit exchange. Yeah. What are you guys seeing in terms of like the option space? Like, is there, I don't know how much you guys can talk about, but what is there demand? I know I'm actively trading these things. They are one of the most interesting products I've seen. Um, but what else? There's is demand, there? Spencer. It, it's coming yeah. on, you know, and, and I think, you know, the, it's interesting for me to watch how this demand has shifted. You know, it really, it really was purely, and I'll, I'll talk, let's talk options for, for, for a moment. It was really speculative demand, you know, the, uh, going a couple of years back. Right. Right. And just people who want to have leverage exposure to an asset that has the chance to four, five, 10, 20 X uh in in some people's opinions and right. uh, and which has has happened um but that that being said the demand for derivatives from from what i can feel anyway is shifting 
to not just be speculatively driven, but to now be focused on risk management. And that's that institutional component that's really coming into play. Um, we can get into some of the strategies that I, I think are, are being deployed. And then you're, we're also seeing, seeing demand now come in for, you know, maybe a little bit more sophisticated type products, like, um, you know, some structured notes, and, and again, that's, that's going to be that sophisticated trader or portfolio manager who's trying to be smart about how they handle risk in this market and how they, you know, accumulate a position. And, and that's, that's a positive for this industry, quite frankly, right. is, 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 is when we have that shift from a purely speculative demand driven marketplace to a, Hey, you know what, this is a, asset that needs to be in our portfolio, but we need to manage the risk in a similar way that we manage risk in a FX position or in a commodity position or in a, in a stock portfolio position. So that that's probably the, the, the biggest thing I've seen um, in terms of the demand for liquidity. And that's, that's promising from, from my perspective. Right. And I, I mean, you see this all over, uh, all over crypto Twitter and the hopium kind of effect of getting what, getting 2% of all of these uh, pension fund, mutual funds to put it on their balance sheet, all of these kind of things. My yep. thought process is they're not going to do it unless there's an active derivatives market, right? They want liquidity. They want kind of, there's multiple ways to put it on your books and just going into the spot market, you're talking about a low float stock essentially right and so if they come in here and bid all of this spot up yeah they're going to be the last players buying it and there's no way they're going to step in at that level right do you see right. that being like a possible narrative or, or where would you kind of think that going certainly i mean i think that is right in in line with with what we're seeing in, in terms of that demand shift from pure speculation to now more professional i'll say uh approach to managing risk around a spot position. That, that, that's really one of my favorite things, you know, and, and the and the the team at Blockfills, I mean, these are all, you know, especially on the options side, these are all guys who are from the pit, right? And they've they've had storied careers, 20 plus year careers. And now they're, you know, they're bringing that same approach uh, to crypto. And I think it's very much appreciated across the board. It's so much fun. I love hopping on the on, on the phone and then talking bids and offers and just saying, yeah, I don't want That's to right. take this. I do want to take this and doing those kind of things. It's yep. it's a lot it's of fun. A, yeah. All right. What uh what else are you interested in? I know you you touched on kind of your background in um, the environmental mm -hmm. space. I don't know if you're doing anything there or. Yeah, I mean that's a great you know great segue. Um, you know, with, with my progression in, in, in trading and, and markets, you know, I've always had an inkling to, um, you know, to find a way to work some of these environmental products into crypto. And I think, you know, I think we've seen some cool stuff happen. Like, you know, there, we're always having debates on, you know, what, you know, what problems do, you know, do, do digital assets solve and, and, and distributed ledger technology, what, you know, what problems does that solve? And I think there's a big one on these environmental products. So, you know, if you want to buy carbon offsets today, it, it's, it's still very tricky, um, especially for the, for the retail investor who wants some exposure to this stuff. Yep. And there's been, um, you know, a pretty big push on the tech side in terms of tokenizing these assets. There, there's a few different protocols, you know, there's just a little bit of research and you can find some of them uh, that have figured out ways to tokenize offsets. And with distributed ledger technology, it goes beyond just the marketplace. You know, I'm not going to go too deep into the fundamentals behind these contracts, but, you know, for, for a carbon offset contract, for example, there has to be, um, you know, the origination of that, of that contract is someone who has generated the offset by, you know, either producing electricity uh, for charging uh, electric vehicle uh, electric vehicle charging stations like a, like a Tesla, yep. you know they they generate these these credits, uh, carbon offsets, renewable energy credits, etc. Same thing with like deforestation projects and and there's there's a whole you know there's a whole list of projects that can develop these credits and then sell them to 
uh, polluters, you know, with, with right. the, the big ones like an airline or, you know, in my case, Bitcoin miner, you know, I think we've yep. seen a lot of propaganda on, uh, quite frankly, on uh, the carbon intensity of, of Bitcoin mining operations. But, you know, to, to, to circle it, to circle it back, I think distributed ledger technology is well positioned to help track the origination of these carbon offsets, help monitor in real time, you know, how, how the contract was able to generate the credit, right? What was the, yep. what was the technology, the methodology, and then being able to track that data, store that data, display it publicly. Distributed ledger technology is perfect for that. It, it's like taking the internet of things in terms of monitoring and, you know, taking real world data <clears throat> and then pumping that through, um, through a blockchain yep. and it's, you know, immutable and it's public, et cetera. Right. And then you can go to the marketplace. Now you can, okay. So now we've, we've used DLT to, you know, kind of figure out how to track and store all this data and make it publicly available. But now we've also figured out a way to tokenize these credits and digitize them in a sense. Right. And now what you can do there is you can really facilitate market access to buy and sell those credits, you know? So that's a big thing. And what, what we're doing at Blockfills is we are, well, we're starting in the physical realm of things. We are, we are bringing carbon offsets and renewable energy credit markets, OTC to yep. start uh, to anybody in, um, in web three slash, you know, crypto uh, development, uh, you know, but namely Bitcoin miners, as yep. that's been kind of the, the, you know, the, the you know, first, first they laugh, then they fight you, then they join you, right? That's typically the progression in technological innovation. And right. we're, at, we're at the then they fight you stage. And one of the fighting points has been the carbon intensity. So Blockfills wants to at least offer a solution to the Bitcoin marketplace on you know, eliminating or offsetting um, you know, some, of those, some of those emissions. And then eventually it will be tokenized. Which to me, when I heard this was insane. Like, this is a huge idea, in my opinion, right? Yes. Like, yes. the, I mean, the narrative at, to this particular point in time is Bitcoin's bad for the environment, and that's the publicity and the marketing that's being pushed. But now if you're being able, or if you're able to provide this solution, yep. what other hate can you kind of throw? Yeah. And, and people will come up with new things, and there'll be new mm -hmm. media cycles that we'll find. But this is a great solution for one of those things. So this is super interesting. I completely agree. And, and that's what that's what you know, that's what's so fun about this space is that, you know, when you are participating in a marketplace that is going through exponential innovation or exponential growth and in innovation terms, there's constant demand for solutions. Right. And and we are uniquely positioned to provide some of those solutions. And that's what, you know, I think certainly my personal mission and then you know the mission of, of Blockfills is to be a steward. Uh, you know, to the digital asset marketplace and community. And, and this is one of the ways we can demonstrate that it's through th thought leadership and be, being subject matter experts, and then following through on those two points with the technology and, and the market access to facilitate the solution. Yeah, yeah. All right. What else? Uh, what else do you see? I know that um, in the option space, where do you see that going? Do you see that currently there's not many solutions for people in the US um, yeah. at the retail level, right? If, if you're an yep. ECP, an ECP for anybody that's watching, it's an eligible contract participant, right? So you yep. can look that up and um, there's particular guidelines that are, they're set by, what is it, the CFTC? That's right. And, um, and then just for regulation and, and make sure that there's clarity. And honestly, I think speculation in this field on 50X leverage doesn't make a lot of sense, right? No. So, um, so that's why those kind of are in place. But where do you see it in terms of the retail space kind of progressing? Is there going to be uh, options for, for retail players? And, and where is that going to go? Yeah, you know, this is an interesting, this is an interesting topic. And, you know, my I don't have a great answer. I, I think right. what the C, what what the CME group has done, um, you know, they've they've been successful in in launching a Bitcoin futures contract, an Ethereum futures contract, and then uh, options markets to go with it, right? And and I think that's, you know, that's a great place for this market to 
you know, have regulated uh, derivatives as that's the most trusted derivatives venue in the world. Right. Um, but I, I do think these crypto native exchanges are searching for a way to position themselves to offer some of these types of contracts to the retail community. Now, you know, when, when I when I think about crypto, just in a very broad scheme of things, since since we're so early in the marketplace, these assets are 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 incredibly volatile, especially on yep. a relative basis. And it goes back to our our talking point on why is there demand for derivatives and why should there be demand for derivatives? From from the retail traders' perspective, they're getting enough movement in the underlying spot asset already, you right. know, and almost to a point where it's even, you know, it's. It, I don't know really how to say it properly, but it's such a volatile market. Retail traders have to be very careful in spot, right? right. And let alone in a leveraged perpetual contract or let alone in getting into speculating on the price of upside exposure for call options or on the price of protection through put options, right? So I think the... I think the general trend is more likely than not that that some of these crypto native exchanges do figure it out and they are able to bring some of these products to the retail market. But I'm I'm certainly, you know, from a market maker's perspective, certainly more interested in derivative markets being built out for professionals who want to use these things to manage risk. Because when, you know, if we, we zoom out again, crypto needs institutional involvement. I mean, Bitcoin's market cap is sub 500 billion right here, yep. right? I mean, it's not even, it's almost a head scratcher in the sense of if this is what it is, we're way underpriced, right? I mean, relative to gold or to silver or, you know, other types of assets that are typically viewed as inflation hedges or stores of value uh, or alternatives to the U.S. dollar. Um, so the, the, the marketplace is better suited to figure out how to serve that institutional clientele on the derivatives for yep. reasons that derivatives contracts were invented in the first place, which is to All manage right. risk, right? Um, to, to end a long winded answer. I, I do believe these, well, these crypto exchanges have proven to be innovative in many regards, and I think they will continue to do so and they will find solutions to the, to the problems that, they, that they're encountering. Um, but I do emphasize that there's enough volatility in uh in the spot market if you're looking to um to position trade and you know retail clients need to be very very careful if they start to step into leverage i think uh like retail brokerages that offer out the um the bitcoin futures right i think mm -hmm. tasty has some of them right you know that, and, that i don't i don't i can't comment too much on the retail side but they yeah. probably do yeah, so I think those are those are definitely options. And the only reason I bring that up is because it is it does move a lot, but the inability to hedge from a retail's perspective is that's a problem, right? And that yeah. needs to be solved, right? So yeah. it's in in a big space, it's retail is seen as dumb money. And mm -hmm. honestly, retail is just anybody that doesn't have an institutional account, right? Like yep. you can have a retail account with a couple million bucks and you're still retail. But um I agree. I agree. So and I do that's, see that's a great point, Spencer. Yeah, I do see that being a great possibility and coming out, but depending on who it is, who knows who it'll be that that pushes that narrative along. Yeah, um, and, and that that's likely the talking point as to what drives that conversation anyway, right? Is that is that you know retail should have the ability to sell covered calls. Yeah. Um, you know, and especially in a Bitcoin denominated, we'll talk Bitcoin for for example's sake. They should be able to sell covered calls in a Bitcoin denominated fashion, right? Where it's not a cash funded option position, but they're able to actually use the Bitcoin they hold as collateral to sell a covered call that is covered by the by the Bitcoin that's in their account. And I, I think, you know, that is that 
that's the argument and right. figuring out how to balance that offering um, and not really make it focused on pure speculation, but uh, focused on risk management will probably be the catalyst to drive it through. That said, I do think there's going to need to be a significant effort on these exchanges to, you know, to offer education on this stuff and, and, uh, you know, and really be at the forefront of, of providing value to their clients and, and not just facilitating markets to get more volume and executions. Right, right. right. All right. Last thing that we can uh, talk about, I think it's been 45 minutes ish. No, it's been 30 minutes ish. But if you want to talk about, um, what do you think about the ETH merge? Where, what are you seeing on that side? What's, yeah. what's the ideas here? Yeah, so the this is this is an interesting one, and I think it ties into the derivative markets. So it's it's a good segue. Um, you know, the Ethereum merge has been talked about right for for a number of months. I, I guess we could even argue um, maybe a year. And right. and now um, you know this is going to be a major major market event for for crypto in a broader broader viewpoint. The, you know, the argument of proof of work, you know, why is Ethereum, you know, moving to proof of stake? And, and I guess there's, there's a myriad of arguments, but, but one of the big ones is that they do want to differentiate themselves away from that proof of work model that, that you know, Bitcoin has really uh, capitalized on. And, you know, that, that, that proof of work is the technology that, you know, and theoretically changed the world, right? I mean, they, they solved the double spend problem and they figured out how to, you know, build network security um, through proof of work. And, you know, for Ethereum to make this step, um, I think they are trying to, you know, at least distance themselves a bit from the energy intensity of, right. you know, running a network. And, yep. but, but also maintaining that security. And yep. I, th I think that Ethereum market cap becomes even more important when you go to proof of stake. So that's something interesting to, you know, to, to, keep, to keep in the back of your mind when you, when you think about this stuff on a broader view. Yep. Um, so, you know, that said, it's a major tech hurdle. And obviously these are some of the sharpest guys in the world, guys and girls working on this problem if it's successful, you know, I think it's a major, major catalyst, not just for Ethereum, but for the broader proof of stake um, marketplaces and tokens. So how that ties in to derivatives is looking at the forward curve for Ethereum. Right. And, you know, we talk about, you know, there's, there's a couple different market internals that, you know, I like to look at, and I think a lot of, a lot of, professionals like to keep keep their pulse on it's it's number one it's the basis you know what what um relative to spot you know how uh, how is forward ethereum or forward bitcoin being priced is it being priced above spot you know all the way through the curve so just you know when i talk about the curve you know currently it's it's july 27th so you know we're talking about august delivered ethereum september October, November, December, right? All the way into right. 2023, about 12 months, 18 months. That, that's the curve I'm talking about. So for, for the merge, it's now, you know, market consensus is that we're looking at September right. um, for this merge to happen. So we're looking at, you know, the market internals around that are basis. You know, what is the forward curve look like relative to spot for Ethereum? Yep. Right now, that basis is pretty flat. Um, you know, we're starting to see a little bit of life come back into that. And so, so it, it is still, uh, you know, it's a contango market where those forward contracts, that forward deliverable Ethereum or, or Bitcoin um, is trading at a premium to spot, but not, not a significant premium. And, and that's something to really keep an eye on. You know, will that basis widen out where, these further dated contracts start trading at an, at an increased premium relative to spot. I think that's something to really keep an eye on. You know, when, right. when we were in our, our big run, um, you know, let's call it 18 months ago at this point, uh, you know, we saw basis 
blow out to, you know, plus 25% annualized. It was incredible. Uh, yeah, it was incredible, <laughs> right? You know, I've never incredible. seen anything like that. Yeah, and, and just to, to bring that home, that, that means you could have bought spot Ethereum and, and sold, you know, three to six month forward and annualized a rate of return of 25%. So, so that's, um, that's a market internal that I think I'm looking at and, and certainly looking at that, you know, the August contract, the September contract, the October contract, how is that, how's that curve starting to shape up? Right. So that's, that's certainly something that's relevant to this Ethereum merge. And then, you know, maybe even more interestingly is, you know, moving from futures, now talking options, um, same curve, but now we're talking about, you know, what we, what we call the, the, the put call skew yep. and, you know, how expensive, uh, relatively speaking, how much more expensive is protection or the demand for puts uh, relative to the demand for upside exposure or call options, right? right. So if, if you look today, I mean, obviously today we've had a, a major spot move here and that curve is, and that curve is moving around. Um, but generally speaking for the, you know, the past week or two, uh, we've seen, you know, protection uh, being more expensive in the front month of the curve relative to that middle slash back end of the curve, that AUG, SEP, AUK. Um, we're seeing more demand for call options in that middle part of that, of the curve, right? right. So, so that's, you know, that's something that, I think all traders should be should be looking at, you know, and and especially when you talk about like a, a market event that we can that we can put a date on or at least an anticipated date on. And then we can see, you know, well, how is the market responding to this? And is the market calling a bluff or is the market saying we think that there is a chance that this market event happens in the case we're talking about the Ethereum merge? So in September uh, dated options, you know, we're seeing more demand for, for call options relative to puts. Now that, that said, protection is still more expensive than upside exposure. Right. Um, Which is different relative, than it yeah. used to be, right? Yes. So, Around. so, you know, going back to our bull run, and this is another, you know, another way to really use this market internal to gauge sentiment and, you know, um, the broader markets, you know, opinion, I guess, I guess sent sentiment yep. um, is that, you know, when we are in our massive bull run, call options were more expensive than put options throughout the curve. Right. Right. And, and that, that really opened up an excellent opportunity for risk management, because if you, if you were during that bull run um, and then, you know, towards the top and as it started to roll over uh, you could be long, spot Bitcoin, spot Ethereum, you know, go down the list and you could sell a call option and you could take the proceeds from that call sale and you could buy a put option at zero cost. We call that a zero cost collar. And at the time when the put call skew was inverted and calls were more expensive than puts, you were selling, you know, let's say, um, let's, you know, let's say Bitcoin was trading at 60,000, you were selling hundred K call options and you were buying protection at 50 K yep. or, you know, I remember, right yeah. around that ratio. Yep. And that was, you know, watching that in real time and trading on that and making a market on that. You could really see how that, how that market internal is super important. Cause we were able to identify, you know, when that skew flipped and it really lined up, you know, really with the with, you know, not the exact top, but right around that top. It was and, close. And, yeah. Uh, it gives you a hell of an insight into, um, you know, into that, into that, uh, that dynamic between puts and calls and how expensive relatively speaking, are they? And, you know, where are things weighted? I remember looking at it and I couldn't believe that that yeah. calls were more expensive. I just, it didn't make sense. Right. Traditional equities, people are bid puts usually, right. That's right. As part of their portfolio. So, um, That's right. Yeah, when I started seeing that, it was incredible, right? And I mean, just from a trader's perspective, and the most interesting thing about these markets is these things, these anomalies that normally don't happen in traditional equities, traditional markets mm -hmm. happen more times than not in this market, right? Even the introduction with the leverage provided amazing opportunities from a trading side, right? 
um that's right over the last two years right so like mm -hmm. if you're looking at some of the leverage some of the the open interest in the futures markets and then you were starting to time that up with the tape and and put it and pull together some of these these market indicators right so the the flip on the skew some of the internals that are really holding the bid on the market there's just there's indicators there that that just they're outsized returns if you can hit them right so it's incredible the the amount of stuff that exists at this time. So, I I, I completely agree. I think it's also part of the maturation of this market. You know the the um, the institutions just really weren't there, right? When, when, especially when the when when basis blew out, there just yeah. wasn't enough liquidity to to offer forward. You know, and right. there was demand, so the demand just kept going through offers, and the thing widened out, and that. You know, in hindsight, that that basis blowout really caught the attention of Wall Street, and yeah. and that's that's the cost of carry trade. I mean, that that's you know that that's a tried and true strategy in a variety of different marketplaces. And when that when that blew out to the levels it did, I think it just you know a lot of eyeballs started started looking at 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 the bitcoin marketplace and then ethereum and down down the, down the line and on top of that like you're saying you know when when calls were more expensive than puts um you know through a massive rally i think that also caught the attention of of wall street and the and those more traditional um you know proprietary trading shops and hedge funds that that take advantage of these types of uh, of market opportunities and that that accelerated the um, the adoption in, in, in my in my opinion. Now that that being said, that's also going to contribute to why those inefficiency. Well, I don't know if you can say inefficiency um, by correct definition, but that, right. you know why some of those opportunities might be a bit harder to come by in in the you know in the next bull run, and and then you know kind of kind of looking forward because there is sophisticated capital here. There's capital on the sideline ready to take advantage of these of these events, and you know it's just it's just going to be a different game um, from a market maturation perspective going forward than what we saw in 2017, and then what we saw, you know, in in the latter part of 2020, and then throughout 2021. All right. So with that being said, where do you see the industry going? Right. Like, is this yeah. the bottom? I mean, don't call the bottom, but yeah. Yeah. You know, you know but... it's, 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 it's never uh, my, in my prerogative to, to pick bottoms or tops, but I do think that the stuff we're talking about this market maturation, you know, when we saw a bunch of panic in the market in June, you know, puts became so expensive that some of these more traditional hedge fund and proprietary trading market participants, well, they started selling puts, yeah. you know, because they're, they're starting to think, well, you know, if, if we want to, you know, maybe take some exposure in this market, how are we going to do it? And when the demand for protection kind of blew out on, you know, on the Luna event and then on, on you know, some of these other, some of the other contagion from the, the credit crunch that the market experienced when Bitcoin broke through 30k and and went down you know i think it traded 17.5 or right around there and we had a credit crunch you know there was massive amount of fear in the marketplace right and so those right. puts got bid up big time and i think a lot of sophisticated players identified that they started selling puts you know they're saying they're willing to take the obligation to own this asset at this strike price at this expiration date right. for this yield right and i think that helps stabilize this market in a sense and not to say that bitcoin is a stable market it's far from it but um that that's the you know that gives me uh, a bit of confidence in saying that you know there's real capital that will step in at attractive levels and you know attractive is always a relative word but you know let's go from the high right that's 68 right. 68 5 whatever high um when you see a market go to 20 uh you know th there's players that want to take a position there yep. and I, you know so i i do think that um i do think bitcoin's got bright days ahead of it if it is what it is you know and i think i think everyone 
that's that's taken a hard look at this market and sticks around, you know, believes in the theos of what Bitcoin is, and then you know, the broader sense what what Web three is and and can be and is trying to be, and um, you know, that whole decentralization aspect and the public ledger and distributed ledger technology. Like there is something here, right? And we're right. so early that it's hard for, for us to really identify exactly what will come out of this. It's like, you know, the email in 1995, I could just send, you know, a fax. Why should I send an email? You know, yep. that was a hard question for people to, to get over. It's, you know, funny for us to think about it that way, or, you know, even the advent of smartphones, you know, no one could see, well, I guess maybe some people could, but a lot of people couldn't see the apps, app revolution that took place. And, you know, there's so many, there's so many things, there's so many known unknowns and also unknown unknowns right. with the evolution of this marketplace and this technology. So I do think brighter days are ahead. Bitcoin's sub $500 billion market cap right here relatively speaking to gold, which is, let's call it around 11 trillion. You know, we got a 20 X to match gold, um, <clears throat> assuming gold doesn't move. Right. Right. right, right. Uh, so, you know, long story short, can't pick tops and bottoms, but I do think there's some sophisticated capital that identified the premium for protection on this credit crunch and massive amount of fear in the marketplace. They did step in. I think that helped to you know, at least put a temporary low in. And now, um, you know, now it's going to be, you know, just a, um, just a battle, I guess, in a, in a macroeconomic sense of, you know, how does, you know, how does the retail client survive? Are they going to be able to participate in their investment portfolios with digital assets? Is right. there going to be cash available for people to, to be, to participate? I'm afraid that, you know, that, that this market, you know, could almost run away in a sense before people got any cash in their pockets again, you know, and, and we'll look back in hindsight and say, well, why didn't we buy more here? And you'll say, well, sh you know, shoot, we were, you know, going through a massive crunch in a you know, macroeconomic perspective and people were tightening up their purse. And, you know, that's kind of how markets typically work anyway. I was about to say that's, yeah. that's normally how it is. Yeah. Now speaking to the credit, the credit crunch, I mean, this to me is everything I've read about 2008 in a new market, right? Yes. And it's some of the scariest things, some of the scariest tape I've ever seen in terms of aggression, in terms of just forced selling across the board. If you're looking at credit markets, even in some of the decentralized markets that were just underwater in terms yeah. of billions of dollars and mm -hmm. that just had to come to market and then you have all of just everything. What was your experience with that? And um, I mean, for you guys to, to, to kind of make it out of there alive is that's a unicorn that speaks to your, to your risk and, and to how you guys run your shop, you know? Yeah, certainly. So there's a couple of points to talk on there. You know, and I think I'll lead by saying, you know, block fills, there's a lot of adults in the room at block fills, you right. know, guys, uh, guys and girls that have been around, markets for 20 to 30 years they've been through many cycles many different events that at you know at their time were the major events and no one could have foreseen them you know and, and right. I, I think that that type of a pedigree um at, from the management perspective you know really was a catalyst for block fills to to you know, kind of keep our nose clean in a sense. Um, you know, when, you know, we, we saw what was going on, you know, there was a massive market for unsecured lending and, you know, it, it, it didn't make a lot of sense to us. And, you know, especially, you know, with, with the background of, of the guys on the team, you know, we were looking for a little bit more of sophistication and, right. and I guess we were scratching our heads a little bit as to, you know, why is some of this stuff, going on and, and why is it why is it such a big marketplace and uh <clears throat> anyway it, it, it just didn't make a whole lot of sense so you know we were we were fortunate in that regard to really you know keep keep a distance from that type of activity and just focus on our, our core mission which is to be a steward for you know the institutional marketplace and 
to be a, you know, to be a tried and true partner for professional execution and dark pooled spot options, dated right, right. futures and lending and borrowing. When I talk lending and borrowing, you know, the, the real market there is the over collateralized yeah. lending and borrowing market where people who own crypto want dollar liquidity. Let's say, you know, the, the, the example there is a Bitcoin miner. You're a Bitcoin miner, you get a block reward. Now you have Bitcoin, you have a choice. You know, do I sell some of that block reward to cover my operating expenses or do I borrow dollars against that Bitcoin in an over collateralized fashion where I'm posting more Bitcoin than dollars I'm receiving to cover OpEx and then still have my Bitcoin to participate in any potential upside. And right. I think that, you know, block fills, we were early in that, in that marketplace and we were early in being good partners to Bitcoin miners and Ethereum miners. Um, that's a, to, to me, that, that, that market makes a whole lot of sense. And I right. think that market will make sense for, you know, for the, the, for Bitcoin until, you know, until the having events take those block rewards to, you know, to a minimum number, but you know, that, that, that's going to be another decade. So, right. um, now Ethereum obviously going to proof of stake and maybe that, you know, that doesn't, you know, the, but there are still interesting things to do in that regard on proof of stake assets, you know, right. so um, long winded answer again, but in short, you know, block has got a lot of adults in the room, as I said, and, and that really helped us steer the ship through, uh, through some of this odd, you know, odd market behavior. Now, not, not to, not to just keep droning on, but, you know, Bitcoin came out of, 2008 yep. right i mean that's why this that's why satoshi nakamoto was thinking about this stuff in the first place and right. and <clears throat> for the market to kind of regress and and start taking on some of these activities that we all know are nefarious i think this credit crunch event is the best thing to happen for bitcoin Get yeah. these players out of the game. And, you know, the crypto market has no space for that type of behavior. You know, when you're, when you're a new technology and you're trying to change the world, and Bitcoin has already changed the world in more ways that we can even think of at the moment that are not quite identifiable to us. Yep. Um, but if you're trying to change the world, you can't, you can't be looking backwards. So, you know, we see some of these guys and, you know, some of these companies who, who came in and they had, you know, a more traditional, well, traditional is not the right word, but a more, uh, you know, a more legacy perspective on risk and credit and, and they goofed, they goofed up and, and now they're, they're paying the price and I'm saying right. it extremely lightly yep. um, and it, the, the faster, the better. I think this marketplace needs to shed that type of participant before we can make another move to the upside. And I think that's, that's been playing out in real time for the, for the past month and a half. All right. Simple question, bull market or bear market, which one's better? Cause well, you know, I, I think, I think it depends on, you know, who you are. If you're, you know, if you're an investor, you want a bull market. If sure. you're, uh, you know, if you're someone who, who's uh, let, let's say, you know, I don't from the market making same, side. Yeah, market making market side, side doesn't matter, right? You know, we're here to stand firm on quotes and, right. and that's our job, right? Right. Um, you know, but if, if you, there's always, there's always opportunity, no matter what the market and, and, you know, let's, let's remove just peer investing, but, you know, talking about a trading perspective, you know, there's, there's, just as much opportunity when this thing starts to put lower lows and lower highs in as there is when there's higher highs and higher lows. Yep. Right. And even when there's neutral digestion and the market can't figure out where it wants to go, you can still trade volatility around that. Right. So, so there, there's always something to do. And right. I think what we, what we have, you know, kind of focused on is, is coming up with structures that can be deployed in a variety of markets and almost be directionally agnostic in how we put together a product suite or like a Chinese menu in a sense of, you know, what can I do 
in a downward trending environment? What can I do in a sideways trending environment? What can I do in a, in a bull trend environment? Right. And, and right. that's, that's where it gets really interesting. And even when Bitcoin does go through some neutral digestion and it can't pick a trend, it's moving up and down, you know, to, to the, to the degree where there's still stuff to do. It's like 5% a day. That's yes. like, yes, that's like we, a normal day. Yeah. We, we've seen, you know, the past month and a half, as we've come out of that low in June and, uh, you know, we, we've seen this thing chop, but it's still moving. Right. Yeah. And, and I think there's been a lot of opportunity in trade and ball, um, you know, in Huge. that shop. And putting on positions that 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 make a lot of sense for that type of an environment, and you know, as we try to pick a direction, there's there's a breadth of things to be doing. Either way, so so I don't have a you know the for an investor you want a bull market for a guy like you Spencer I'm pretty sure you can figure out what to do in any type of environment. <laughs> Hey, I'm looking for five percent, seven percent a day. That's what I'm looking for. As long as it moves, I'm happy. Yeah, I'm happy. Yes. All right. Yeah, I mean, so, and that, and that, you know, just to finish on that thought, I, I think yeah. that there's, you know, when we're talking about creating a, you know, kind of a menu, you know, we talk about, we've talked today, we've talked about perpetual swaps, we've talked about yep. spot markets, we've talked about options markets, we've talked about dated futures, we've talked about forward curves and how you can interact with the market that way and, and, and get a, get a, you know, kind of a, a look on some internals. You know, I think the next step is as this institutionalization continues for this market, I think that, you know, some strategies, some structured product strategies are going to be coming into play. Some stuff that was deployed in FX, yep. uh, you know, for, for accumulation and risk management. I think that stuff comes to crypto, uh, you know, what was deployed in FX and commodity markets for decades, I think gets repurposed and repackaged for the uh, institutional investor um, and, and that's just going to be, you know, going back to, to your point on, you know, on direction, these guys, these guys need a way to participate and, right. and, you know, it's kind of up to the marketplace to, to give them the options, uh, for lack of a better word to, to do so. I mean, participation is good in any level, right? So yes. getting yes. that access, being able to provide that is huge. So, yes. yep. all right. I, I, I completely agree. Let's uh, let's go and wrap it up. But uh, last five minutes, you can let's show some things. What uh, I have had the pleasure to wa or work with Black Fills for what has it been? It's been a year now. It's you know Spencer. It feels like longer than that. You're probably right. Probably about a year. Um, yeah, you know I I, I think not not to, not to hammer the point too hard, but you know Black Fills, we have figured out a way to to really provide value to institutional clients and not to just keep harping on the same points. But I think that I don't want to understate the importance there because, you know, it's firms like ours um, that will, that will hold the hand of the legacy trader hedge fund into this market sure. and um, create the products and the offerings and the technology stack required to to bring confidence for this um for this type of participation and and this is going to be incredibly important if bitcoin is to uh you know graduate and and, and kind of grow up into its next stage uh of progression and you know bitcoin has has historically been a retail driven marketplace right which is fantastic quite frankly, but um, to, to come into its own and, and mature into the posture uh, of being an asset that, you know, is that store of value, is that dollar alternative, um, you know, it really does need to have a significant market cap. Right. And to, to get there, it's not going to be driven by retail. Uh, retail certainly should be able to participate in that that process, um, but but for block fills, it's important for us to be stewards uh, to the institutional market, and you know be a catalyst for 
for that conversion from you know legacy only to legacy and digital assets so that that's that's our primary focus that's what we're that's what we go to work to do every day and um and i think we've proven that and especially through this through this uh that this this recent market turmoil um you know we've really been able to shine for for our our partners and i think you can attest to that so it's um it's been a pleasure quite frankly and then you know on my side so you know so so you know trying to find ways to 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 grow and you know continue on you know trading is a journey and and, and you have to, you know participating in markets is a journey and right. you got to love the journey right and 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 find ways to continue journey or roller that. coaster it's yeah, one of journey the two. or roller coaster yeah, <laughs> it might yeah, be both <laughs> probably a little bit of both it's a journey on a roller coaster so yeah no doubt yeah so so just just trying to find ways to keep walking that path right and and i think you know some of the stuff um that, that has been able to be accomplished you know i've written a book uh introduction to futures markets and you know i think the you know why did i write that book well number one i wanted to get stuff out of my head put it on paper you know because that stuff starts spinning in your mind yep. and you got to put it on paper right but the 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 leg two of that is you know education and not enough people that come into markets you know have had the opportunity to you know to really understand the fundamentals of what they're participating in yep. so you know so that book was written with with that goal in mind and you know there's also a course associated with that book then you know in 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 turn there's a there's another book called building statistical arbitrage trading strategies yep. and and this book was written for the same reason you know to 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 get some stuff out of my mind but also to um i believe for the first time uh put some of these real strategies that are deployed by some of the largest trading firms around the world into right. the public domain Yep. and allow someone who is interested in this subject to be able to get that education on how to build some of these high frequency you know market liquidity provision strategies um without having to get hired by a massive proprietary trading company or right. you know or some type of hedge fund right so right. so that stuff's been built out you can find me at johndevine.io and you can also find me on linkedin you can find me on twitter at i am john divine i'm always happy you know one of the one of the best parts of being able to disseminate some of this information publicly is working directly with you know some hungry go-getter type people who just refuse to stop until they can wrap their heads around some of this subject material and it's a pleasure of mine to um you know to have met some people through these avenues and to have worked directly uh with people in, in grasping some of these concepts and eventually deploying these strategies professionally yep yep yeah so we will uh we'll drop that all in the show notes but um i can speak to to both of those right so i've read the book it's amazing um definitely opened my eyes to a couple different things that I'm going to be uh, kind of deploying. And then uh, it's been a pleasure working with Blockfills, right? So that's why I wanted to have you guys on as uh, one of the first episodes in the uh, the Crypto Misfit Happy Hour. So it's, it's been great, Spencer. And, you know, this is this, this show, you know, hopefully will uh, open some eyes for, for people who are curious about crypto and for for those who are already in it, hopefully some some interesting insights into uh, you know into some of the ways that we're we're looking at the market, how we're thinking about it, and how we're participating. Definitely, definitely. All right, that's it. We'll see you next week. All right, thanks, Spencer. Thanks for having me. Later. Bye. -bye.